Warren Buffett says that if you can't find a way to make money while you sleep, you are going to work until you die. This is what passive income is all about. Using your money as a tool to make you money without you having to physically do anything. And in this video, I'm going to be going over 10 ways you can earn this type of passive income with just $1,000. What's up everybody? I am Jasperin Singh from TheMinorityMindset.com and welcome to The Minority Mindset. Passive income is the holy grail when it comes to wealth building because now you are earning money while you sleep. This is what wealthy people spend all their time building. They want passive income. We all only have 24 hours in a day and you don't want to spend 20 of those 24 hours working. You want to have your money working for you and this is what passive income is all about. You take your money, you throw it somewhere and now your money's out making you money 24 hours a day while you're sleeping, while you're on the beach and while you're watching YouTube videos. Once you start investing for passive income, it becomes addicting. Like you might just start off by getting $100 in passive income one year, but the next year your goal might be how do you make $100 in a month? Then the year after that it might be how do you make $100 a week? Then after that, it might be, how do you make $1,000 a month? You can get this type of passive income by investing one of two things. You can either invest your time or your money. You can invest your time into building this money-making machine, like let's say a guacamole business that you can eventually walk away from that will continue to pay you, or you can just throw your money into this money-making machine and have other people work to grow your money and pay you. Obviously, the easier option is just to throw money at this money-making machine because now you don't have to do any of the work, but you do have to put in the time to get that money in the first place. One of the biggest myths that people have when it comes to this type of passive income is that you have to be very wealthy or have a ton of money in order to get passive income. But that's just not true. I mean, if you have more money, then you can get more passive income, but you don't need a ton of money to start investing for passive income. That's why in this video, I'm going to be going over 10 ways you can start seeing this passive income in your bank account right now with just $1,000. The first seven ways I'm going to be going over are completely passive. These are things where you can just throw your money at something and then every month or every year or every quarter, you're going to have money deposited into your account and the last three ways are pseudo passive income which require a little bit of work up front but they can earn you a whole lot more passive income in the back end. The first way you can get this type of passive income is by investing in dividend stocks. When you invest in stock you are buying ownership in a company. Like if you go out and you buy just one share of the McDonald's stock you are one of the owners of the McDonald's corporation. Now you're only going to own like one 745 millionth of the entire corporation, but you're still one of the owners of McDonald's. Some companies like McDonald's pay their owners, their shareholders, people like you, dividends, which are cash checks just for investing in their company. When a company has a bunch of cash in their bank account at the end of the year, there's three things that they can do with this cash. They can save this money for an emergency, they can invest it into their future so they can invest in more stores, they can create new products, or they can pay their shareholders. One of the ways that they can pay the shareholders is through a dividend, which is passive income for you. So if you go out and you buy one share of the McDonald's company, then every three months, every quarter, McDonald's is going to deposit a little bit of cash into your bank account. This is your dividend, your profit share check into your account just because you are one of the shareholders or owners of McDonald's. Let me give you an idea of what this is actually going to look like with a $1,000 investment because I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there on how passive income works because you have all these people on Instagram and Facebook talking about, hey, here's how you can make $10,000 a month in passive income by doing nothing in 60 days. That's a big lie, by the way. So let's go over how passive income really works. McDonald's pays a 2.4% dividend yield. That means if you deposit $1,000 into the McDonald's company today over the next year, you can expect to make about $24 in passive income from McDonald's. IBM pays a 5% 0.5% dividend yield, which means if you deposit $1,000 into IBM over the next year, you can expect to make something like $55 in passive income. And AT&T at the time of me recording this video is paying a 7% dividend yield, which means if you invest $1,000 into AT&T, the company, they will pay you about $70 in passive income over the next year. Now, $24 or $70 is not life-changing money. This is not going to buy you that dream car or that fancy vacation or that private jet that everybody's talking about on social media. But it's to start. $24 is better than no money because if you didn't invest this money in McDonald's and you spent this thousand dollars at McDonald's, you would be left with nothing except a very bloated stomach, right? But if you're investing this money into the McDonald's company, at least you make making $24 in passive income, which you wouldn't have if you didn't invest it into McDonald's. Plus, you have to understand that you're investing into companies like you're investing into McDonald's or IBM or AT&T and your goal with these investments is to see these companies grow. So if McDonald's is making more money, their stock 
price is also going to go up, which means your investment value also went up. Now, if McDonald's is making more money in the future, then your dividends are going to go up as well, which means you're going to be making more money in passive income. So if you really want to win in this game, you got to consistently keep investing in strong companies. That way you can build wealth by owning a large share of a company, and that way you can make money as the company makes more money. So before I go on to the second way you can make money through passive income, let's make sure our expectations are clear. A thousand dollar investment is not going to make you a millionaire overnight, okay? A thousand dollar investment is going to make you some passive income, but it's better than no passive income, and it's the building block to help you build that wealth. That way you can get that financial freedom that you're looking for. The second way you can get this type of passive income is by investing in REITs, which are real estate investment trusts. I discovered passive income when I became a real estate investor because when I bought my first real estate investment property, this property paid me something like a couple hundred dollars a month in profit every single month, and this was money I didn't have to physically earn. This was money the tenants had to pay me because they were living in my property. I love real estate investing as a way to generate passive income, but there's a couple of downfalls that come with real estate investing. First, you need a lot more cash because you have to buy physical real estate. And second, you have to deal with tenants. If you're investing in real estate, you're gonna have tenants that slip and fall while they're taking a shower, and then they're gonna sue you because they will say that the bathtub was too slippery when it was wet. This has happened to me. If you invest in real estate, you are gonna have tenants who are cutting cucumbers on their countertops and then they're gonna call you crying because they missed the cucumber and they slashed the countertop and they're gonna demand that you buy them a new countertop. That has also happened to me. Now, you can hire a property manager that way you're not super hands-on involved in your real estate investments, but if you don't wanna deal with the headache of investing and owning your own real estate properties, the next best thing is by investing in a REIT, a real estate investment trust, because now you're investing in a company Company that invests in real estate. The interesting thing about REITs for you is that they are required by law to follow something called the 90% rule, which says that they have to distribute 90% of their taxable income to you, their shareholders, through dividends. What that means is now you can go out and invest in a REIT on the stock market. So this REIT is a company that invests in real estate. You invested in this company, and now this company is going to invest in real estate. Now, anytime this company makes money through their rental income, they have to distribute 90% of their profits to you through dividends. So if I diagram this out, this is you. I'm gonna draw you a nice mustache. And if you go out and you invest in this REIT, this REIT is a company that invests in this real estate. Now, this real estate, let's assume this is an apartment complex. These tenants are gonna have to pay your REIT, this company, rent, and then this REIT is gonna have to pay their expenses and pay their bills, and then out of what money is left, they're gonna take 90% of this money, and they're gonna distribute this money out to people like you shareholders through dividends. Let me give you a couple examples so you know what to expect when it comes to returns. I'm not telling you what to invest in in this video, I'm just giving you examples, that way you can get an idea of how this type of passive income investing works. And while I'm at it with the disclaimers, I should also tell you that investing has risks. You are never guaranteed to make money when you invest, you might even lose money, so always, always, always do your own due diligence and never blindly listen to a random guy on YouTube. SPG is Simon Property Group, and this is a company that invests in a lot of mixed use and major property developments throughout the United States, and they are paying a 6.5% annual yield. So if you invest $1,000 into this REIT, you are gonna get $65 back in passive income without doing anything, and you also don't have to deal with any tenant issues because your REIT, the company, is gonna deal with that headache. So you're investing in a company that's investing in real estate, and your company is doing all the work and all the headache and all the management stuff with the real estate, you're just getting that passive income. NLY is Annually Capital Management, and they do something a little bit different. So so they don't actually own the physical real estate properties, they own the loans. They invest in commercial mortgage-backed securities and they pay an 11 and a half percent annual return. So if you go out and you invest $1,000 into NLY, you will make about $115 in passive income while doing nothing while this company does the work. And the bigger the dividends get, the more risk there is. So these are things you want to keep in mind. At this point, what a lot of people start doing is they start Googling how to find the highest dividend yielding stocks, and then they just invest in companies that are paying the highest dividends. As somebody who did that during his college years, let me give you a little bit of a warning. You should never solely make your investment decision based off 
half of what dividend a company is paying because that dividend yield can be very deceiving. Let's say you want to invest in this hypothetical company that is trading for $100 a share and they're paying a 5% annual yield. So if you invest $1,000 into this company, they'll pay you $50. If you invest $100 into it, they'll pay you $5 over the next year. Now, what you want to pay attention to is how strong the actual company is because let's say this company starts to do really bad, they start losing money and they're on the verge of bankruptcy and this stock tanks in price, they go from $100 a share to $20 a share because they're doing really bad financially. At this point, if they have not adjusted their dividends yet, it will look as if they're still paying this $5 annual yield, right? This is how much money they were paying here. And assuming they haven't adjusted their dividends, it will look like they're paying a $5 annual dividend for a $20 share price of the stock. That is what? A 25% return on your money. So people might look at this and say, wow, this company is amazing. They're paying 25% a year on my money. But what you don't understand is that this company might be on the verge of bankruptcy. So yeah, you might make a little bit of dividends, but then next thing you know, this company could go bankrupt. Or if they don't go bankrupt, they can also cut their dividends to zero and now you are owning a company that is not really doing anything. This is why it's very important before you start investing in companies for the dividends that you're analyzing their financials and you're analyzing the fundamentals of a company that where you're investing in a company that you want to own that is gonna be more profitable in the future than it is today. And if this is very overwhelming, or if you don't want to do this, or if you don't know how to do this, then you might want to consider looking at three, index funds. With an index fund, now you don't have to find the perfect company to invest in. You can invest in a fund or a group of stocks which give you exposure to a bunch of different stocks. And now if you're investing for dividends, this passive income, you can invest in a fund that is giving you this passive income. There's a few ways you can go about this. One thing you can do is invest in a fund like VOO that's gonna give you exposure to the general stock market. So VOO invests in the top 500 companies in the stock market. So if you invest in VOO, you're getting exposure to the top 500 companies in the stock market. At the time of me recording this video, VOO is paying a 1.75% dividend. So if you invest $1,000 into VOO today, over the next year, you can expect to make something like $17, $18 in passive income from dividends. Again, this is the money you're making by doing nothing except just throwing your money into this fund. And you also have exposure to the top 500 companies in the stock market. So the goal is also to see your $1,000 principal, your investment, go up in value as well. VNQ is the Vanguard Index Fund for REITs. So if you want to invest in REITs and get exposure to real estate, but you don't want to do all that work to find the best REIT to invest in and risk your REIT going bankrupt, one thing you can do is invest in VNQ because this fund gives you exposure to a whole bunch of different REITs. At the time of me recording this video, VNQ is paying 3.85% a year in dividends. VYM is the Vanguard Index Fund that gives you exposure to high dividend yielding companies. So if you want to invest in companies that are paying high dividends and you don't want to go out and find all these companies, you can just invest in a fund like VYM which invests in high dividend yielding companies. At the time of me recording this video, VYM is paying 3.62% a year in dividends. Again, these are not life-changing amounts if you just invest a thousand dollars but it's the foundation to building wealth that way you can create a whole new passive income stream because this is money you're making without doing anything you just throw your money into these funds and then your funds are investing in companies which are doing the work to earn your money and this is what you're making without doing anything if you are interested in learning how you can grow this type of passive income even quicker stay tuned because i'm going to be talking about how you can amplify these things by doing something called pseudo passive income investing but i'll get to that in just a little bit also if you ever want to learn more about how to invest in stocks or passively invest your money. We have articles on this on our website, theminoritymindset.com, and I'll also link it for you in the description below. The fourth way you can get passive income is by investing in crowdfunded real estate. Investing in crowdfunded real estate is similar to investing in a REIT where you're investing in a company that invests in real estate, but now with crowdfunded real estate, you're actually investing into a fund that gives you direct exposure to the real estate itself. You can't invest in crowdfunded real estate on the stock market. You have to go through a third-party platform which gives gives you exposure to these real estate investments. This would be using something like Fundrise, and on their website it says that the historical returns for the last number of years has been something like 8 to 12% a year. Now this 8 to 12% figure is not just the amount of passive income you're getting, this is the passive income you're getting through dividends, and it's also the appreciation in a property. So the way this works is you are investing directly into a fund, and this fund mimics the returns that a real estate property or a group of real estate properties is getting. So if these real estate properties 
properties go up in value, your fund goes up in value, and if these real estate properties make money through rent, then you make some money through rent as well. This is what your dividends are. Again, with this type of crowdfunded real estate, you're not the one going out and finding real estate deals. You're not the one going out and finding tenants. You're not the one managing tenants or paying the bills. You're just investing into a fund that gets exposure to this real estate, and there's other people that are doing all the work, and as these real estate deals make money, so do you. So this is an easy way for somebody to get exposure to real estate and get passive income from real estate without actually going out and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars buying physical real estate investments. If you are interested in learning more about how crowdfunded real estate works and how you can invest in real estate, we have articles on this on our website, theminoritymindset.com, and I'll also link it for you in the description below. The fifth way you can earn passive income is by being a banker without actually being a bank. The way this works is you find people who want to borrow money. Maybe they don't want to go to a bank to borrow money or they can't qualify to borrow money from a bank. And so you can lend money to these people and in exchange for them borrowing your money, they will pay you interest every single month, just like you have to pay the bank interest if you borrow money from the bank. The interesting thing about this is that if somebody can't qualify to borrow money from a bank, they're going to have to pay you higher interest to make up for this higher risk. There's a couple ways you can go about doing this. I mean, you can find somebody who wants to borrow a thousand dollars, but then you're going to have to create all the paperwork and manage the investment, which is a lot of time and a lot of paperwork, which isn't very passive. Or you can use an online lending platform out there like Lending Club. They're not paying me to say this. I'm just giving you an example. These are the return numbers I just pulled off their website to give you an example of how this type of lending works. So they say their average return, their average interest rate is 14%. So this is the money the borrowers are going to pay to borrow money. Now, out of this 14%, you're not going to get all this money because some people are just not going to pay their loans and other people are going to pay their loans off early. If you pay a loan off early, you pay less interest. So this is less interest than you get. So they say to apply an 8% factor of loss, either from people not paying their loans or from people paying off their loans early. And then they apply another 1% fee for their commission. Now, after these fees, you are left with something like a 5% return. And so this is money you're making monthly through interest, and you're also getting a little bit of principal back every single month. And so you just lend this money out, let people use your money, and then they're gonna have to pay you interest to use your money. The sixth way you can make money is by renting out some of your home. When I was in college, me and my roommate would talk a lot about business ideas, and one idea that we came up with was on weekends that we weren't in the apartment, we could sublet our apartment out to other people who wanted to stay in our city and our campus when we weren't there. It's an easy way to make money because if you're not in your home for a weekend, you can have someone else stay there and they'll pay you rent for that weekend. Back then it was really hard to do because there was no such thing as Airbnb or if there was Airbnb I had never heard of it. If you're not at your home for a weekend or if you have extra space like a basement or an extra room you could put this on Airbnb for weekends that you want other people to stay there. Or the alternative, if you're cool with other people living in your property, is if you have extra space in your home, maybe it's a basement or a guest room or an in-law suite. If you have this extra space, you can rent it out to somebody else and they will live there and then they're gonna pay you rent every single month for using your property and you don't really have to invest that much extra money because you already have the space and it's sitting there vacant and now someone's gonna use it and pay you passive income every single month for using your space that you're not using. Depending on where you live, that can be an extra 200 to $1,000 a month every single month in passive income and you don't even have to invest $1,000 to do that if you have this space. The seventh way to get passive passive income is by investing in municipal bonds. Earlier on in this video, I was talking about how you can get passive income by investing in stocks to get dividends. Now, when you invest in stocks, you become one of the owners of a company. With bonds, it's a little bit different because now you're not becoming an owner of anything. You are just investing your money by giving loans and you're getting paid with interest. If you didn't already know, cities and states love spending money that they don't have. So this this might be used to build schools or build roads or build police systems. And so in order to fund this, they need to borrow money. One of the ways that local governments borrow money is by issuing bonds to people like you, investors. This is what a municipal bond is. A municipal bond is when you are loaning money to a local government. This might be your city or this might be your state. And now you are loaning your money to the city or the state and the city or state is going to pay you back with interest. So every single month, you're going to get paid with a little bit of interest. And at the end of the loan, this is called the maturity date, you're going to get your thousand dollars, your initial investment back. There's a couple things that make municipal bonds very interesting. One is they tend to be very safe because nobody thinks that cities and states are going to go bankrupt. And second, they can be tax-free investments. If you lend money to the government, they are federally tax-free. That means you're not gonna have to pay any federal taxes. But there's also a second layer of tax called state taxes. So places like New York and California have very high state taxes, 
But if you invest in a New York municipal bond or a California municipal bond and you live in New York or California, then you also don't have to pay any state taxes on the income. But in order to avoid paying these state taxes, you have to live in the state where this bond is located. So if you are investing in a New York municipal bond and you don't live in New York, then you're going to have to pay state taxes on your income. But if you live in New York and you're investing in a New York municipal bond, then you're not going to have to pay any federal taxes on your income and you also don't have to pay any state taxes on your income. People are always debating over tax rates because the more money you make, the more taxes you have to pay. And so if you're making a lot of money in passive income, you might be subject to really high taxes. This is where municipal bonds can come in handy because if you make a lot of money, you can invest in a municipal bond and make money without having to pay taxes. One example of this is FNYQX. This is a fund that invests in New York municipal bonds and it has a $1,000 minimum investment requirement. So if you invest in this fund with $1,000, this fund will pay you just about 2.5% a year in interest on your money. This is where things get really interesting because this 2.5% that you're earning is tax-free. So if you are a really high income earner, then this 2.5% that you're earning tax-free is actually something like 5% that you would have been earning before taxes. So as you start to generate your passive income and you build your wealth and you have the high income, municipal bonds are things that you can think about using as a way to kind of shield yourself against taxes. Now the next three ways that you can make passive income, so numbers 8, 9, and 10, are what I call pseudo-passive income. These aren't things where you can just throw your money at something and then walk away, but these are things where you invest your time and your money, and if you do this the right way, then you can eventually create this new passive income stream where you're making money a whole lot faster than if you just threw your money into something and walked away. The simplest example of this is number eight, making videos. I can tell you from firsthand experience that you can start a great YouTube channel with less than $1,000. Like we started this Minority Mindset YouTube channel with my cell phone in front of a white wall. We didn't have any fancy equipment, any editing software, any sound equipment. I literally just started this with the cell phone that I had and I was recording videos on a tripod in front of my white wall. I probably spent like 50 or $75 to getting this channel started. And now we have kind of evolved into a full media company from a very small investment. Here's the caveat. Making YouTube videos is hard and being consistent is even harder. But if you work really hard at this and you make your videos and you constantly try to improve and you work very hard at constantly putting out content that people want to watch, eventually YouTube will see that and YouTube will share your content with other people. Now, if that happens, the videos that you produced six months ago and a year ago and two years ago and five years ago will continue to generate you revenue today. If you put in that work initially to build that YouTube channel, you can build a consistent revenue stream of at least $1,000 a month, if not $1,000 a week, or maybe even $1,000 a day. That is very possible with YouTube if you stay consistent and you keep putting in that work to produce quality content but it's not going to happen overnight. This is why I call it pseudo passive income because it takes a whole lot of work in the beginning but if you put in that work in the beginning you can create a new passive income stream because all those videos that you created over the life of your YouTube channel will continue to generate you revenue for years into the future. Nine is affiliate blogging. Every company on the internet wants more sales and one of the ways that companies can attract more sales is through affiliate marketing. Affiliate marketing is when you promote somebody else's product and anytime somebody buys that product through your link on your blog, then you are going to get paid a commission. Now, if you like working out, then one thing that you can do is create a blog where you teach people how to work out and how to burn fat. Then within these articles, you can link to your favorite supplements using your affiliate link. That way, anytime people read your article about how to burn fat and they click on your affiliate link and they buy the supplement, you will get paid a commission. The cool thing about this is it's very inexpensive to start. You don't have to pay any money to start doing this type of affiliate marketing because you can just reach out to your favorite companies and say, hey, can I promote your products as an affiliate? And then they're gonna give you a special link that anytime somebody buys their products with your link, you will get paid. And we're in the digital age where you can start a brand new website with literally zero dollars because there are so many free website builders out there that you can use and you can start writing articles on these websites and then when people come to your website and they click on that link you will get paid well they have to click on the link and actually make a purchase but you get the idea this brings me to number 10 you can be an influencer now not everybody wants to be a celebrity like kim kardashian and you don't have to be to make money as an influencer when i say become an influencer essentially what i mean is you become an influencer on social media either as your personal self 
or through a business brand page. It costs you zero dollars to go out and create an Instagram page. And if you go out and create an Instagram page and you start producing content, so this is gonna take you time, but you produce content that people wanna see and they want to engage with and you start to build a following, you can sell advertisements on your Instagram page. Once you get to something like 10,000 followers, then you can charge somewhere between 10 and $100 per post that you put on your page every single time you post something on your page. The amount of money that you can charge per post is gonna depend on a few factors. It depends on what type of niche your page is, what type of product you're promoting, and what demographic your audience is. But once you build that audience base on Instagram, which is not easy to do, it takes time, but if you put in that work to build that audience, now you can continually sell advertisements and keep putting out Instagram posts because once you have that audience, it is very inexpensive and very easy to make a new Instagram post and you can charge brands a lot of money to do that. Everybody on the internet will tell you how great passive income is. Make money while you sleep. Who doesn't want that? But the part that you're missing and the part that nobody on the internet will tell you is that the only way, the only way that you can get passive income is by getting active income first and then investing that. Passive income is a byproduct of your active income that gets invested. When you get the active income, the passive income part is not that difficult. You can throw your money into dividend paying ETFs or dividend paying stocks or go out and buy some real estate. If you do these things and you manage it the right way, you can start generating this quote unquote passive income. And yeah, there's a little bit of a learning curve there, but that all could be learned on how to actually put your money to work. But the part that so many people don't understand and that so many people miss is that you need this. You need the active income in order to generate any sort of passive income because what so many people are looking for is I'm broke. I don't have much money. How can I make money from nothing without putting in any work? And that's not how it works. If you really want to generate true passive income or cash flow, as I like to call it, you have to start generating money first. And then you take this money and you use it to buy an asset. What asset? Dividend paying stocks, dividend paying ETFs, cash flow producing real estate. You go out and buy these things that will then pay you for owning them. But how do you buy these things? You gotta have money in the first place. So in order to really understand this quote unquote passive income, you have to start by understanding how to generate more active income. So I wanna start today's video by going over how you can get more active income and then go over how you can then use that money to buy this passive income because you gotta have the active income first. Now there's two general ways that you can generate this active income. Number one is by you working in somebody else's company and number two is you working in your own company. In both situations, you are an employee. Everybody who says if you go start your own business, you're no longer an employee. Yes, you are. You're just an employee of your own business. Now maybe if you can scale your business up, you can hire a new CEO and you don't have to work there anymore, now you just get the profits. But if you're working in your business and you're getting paid a paycheck, you are an employee even if it's your own business. So now, what do you do with the salary that you make? Well, you can take some of this salary and you can spend some of it. You can invest some of it and you can save some of it. The way that you can generate your passive income here is by taking some of this money that you put aside for your investments. Again, whether you are an employer or an employee is you take some of this money that you put aside for your investments and you can use this money to buy cash while producing assets. You take this money, you go buy some real estate that pays for rent. You take this money and you go out and buy some cash flow producing real estate. You buy some dividend paying stocks. You buy some dividend paying ETFs. Now, the mistake that so many people make here is they go out and they spend all their money and then they say, well, how do I generate passive income? I have no money to invest. How do I find a system that can pay me without doing anything? It doesn't work like that. You can't spend all your money and then wonder how you're gonna become wealthy. You gotta stop making everybody else rich first, that way you can make yourself rich, and that means you gotta stop spending all of your money. Okay, so you don't spend all of your money, now what's next? Well, this is where things get a little bit tricky because on one hand, you wanna start investing for passive income. And so if you start just taking all of your extra money and you invest it for passive income today, now you're gonna start generating a little bit of passive income. However, the second thing that you can do is take this money and invest it for more active income. For example, AI, not artificial intelligence, active income. If you are an employer, if you created your own company and you work a salary in this company, your business makes $500,000. Amazing. Well, you could take all that $500,000 and you can spend it on a new car, which isn't going to give you any return, or you can take that $500,000 and go and buy some real estate. Now, that real estate or these stocks, they might pay you three, five, seven percent a year in cash flow, but that's kind of where it's going to end. I mean, you're not going to get 55% cash flow on that $500,000 that you invest. Sure, you were able to make more money because you had your own business or maybe you're a high paid employee, but what if now, 
Instead of going for that cash flow, that passive income right now, you took that money and you invested it for more active income. If you're an employee, maybe you take that money that you're making and you invest it into learning a new skill. You invest it into learning how to get a career change. You invest it into getting a certificate. You invest it into some business idea that we can earn more money. Or if you're an employer, you take the money that you're making and instead of going out and buying real estate, which is better than going out and buying a car, what if you take that money and you invest it back into your business? Now maybe you can turn that $500,000 into $5 million. Now you have the ability to invest for more cash flow because that $5 million is going to buy you more cash flow than $500,000 will, just like $500,000 will buy you more cash flow than $5,000 will. And this is where now you have to start asking the question of what do you want with your cash flow? And the answer for the majority of people is, I want to have cash flow coming in passively that pays for my lifestyle. That's what it means to be financially free. And so now if we just do the math, if you want to generate enough cash flow to live your lifestyle, how much cash flow do you need? Let's assume that you need $50,000 a year of cash flow. You need $50,000 a year coming in passively without you having to do any work in order for you to be financially free. Well, if your cash, if your investments can generate, let's just say 5% a year in cash flow, how much money do you need invested in order to generate this $50,000 a year? If you can get a 5% cash flow, whether it's from your stocks or your real estate, that means you have to invest $1 million in order to generate $50,000 a year. Now, where do you get this million dollars? This has to come from your active income. So now, how can you get this million dollars sooner? Well, you can keep investing a little bit of money every single month, year after year after year, which is a good plan for a lot of people, or you can also start investing this money into your own income. That means investing in classes, reading books, investing in coaching, investing in whatever to help you increase your income. Now again, if you are your own boss, if you are an employer and you have your own business, well, now you could take this money and invest it back into your business. This was a, a kind of a question and something that I had to go through as well, because in the early stages of my entrepreneurial career, I was doing whatever I could to make some money, whether it was hosting parties because I got started on my entrepreneurial journey in the event planning industry, or whether it was wholesaling real estate and selling real estate and doing e-commerce. When I was doing all of this, the only thing that I did was I made money and then I used this money to buy real estate. Now that was good because I was able to build up a portfolio of real estate that was paying me with this, this passive, ish cash flow but as i started to grow i started to realize that there might be a better option with the money that i'm investing because yeah i'm buying real estate which is good i like the cash flow that i'm getting for real estate but what if i could 10x how much money that i had to invest in the real estate and the only way for me to do that was to increase my active income and that's when i started to figure out and start to study and start to learn of different ways for me to invest my money into more of an active income, of how I can grow my active income, that way I would have more money to invest. And that was what kind of inspired me to start building out Briefs Media, which you might've heard me talk about over the last number of years, but Briefs Media was then a way for now me to invest more of my money, that way I can grow the active income that way then I have more money to ultimately invest in things like real estate and everything else and to build a company that serves a bigger purpose. Now, of course, the company has to serve a purpose in order to be valuable, but this is where now the question is, what is the best option for you? And the reason why I'm talking to you about it like this is because I remember I talked about this before, but I met this young guy in the gym, 21, 22 years old, young guy, hustler talking about how he wants to build passive income and how his goal is just to have enough passive income to live his life financially free. But at the same time, he's an entrepreneur. And so my question was, well, instead of taking that little bit of money that you have every single month and buying this cash flow, what if you use that to 10 X your income, to take your income from hundred thousand dollars a year to a million dollars a year? or $10 million a year, then what? You're gonna have way more ability to have that cash to actually go out and invest into what you're thinking is the passive cash flow. Now, the reason why I don't keep calling it passive cash flow, passive income, is because there is always some element of management involved. I own real estate, I own cash flow producing stocks. There's still some management involved with my real estate. I have regular meetings with my property management companies to review the financials to review how the numbers are looking. And if there's changes that got to be made, we'll make those changes. I don't go and have to deal with the tenants. I don't have to go and fix the toilets when they get clogged, but I'm still overseeing the operations. It's the same thing with stocks. I don't have to go and 
pick the stocks because I'm investing in a lot of dividend paying funds, but I still oversee them and look at the returns and then make sure things are okay. So it's not operating them. It's not even like a daily management. It's more like overseeing it, which is why it's not completely passive. That's why I prefer to call it cash flow. But this is where now, again, you got to understand what's more important to you right now. Is it just getting a little bit of cash flow or is it increasing your income that way you have more income? to get the cash flow. Now, once you answer that question for yourself, the question is, well, what's the best place for you to generate that cash flow? And this is where I do want to let you know that my team at Briefs Media has this amazing ebook titled How to Build Wealth as an Investor that walks you through things like how do you build a mindset of an investor to how do you save your first couple thousand dollars to how do you invest for cash flow? This ebook goes over multiple different strategies that you can use for that. It also goes over how you can spend your money smartly, earn money smartly, and protect your assets. This ebook is completely free. So if you'd like a copy of this ebook, all you gotta do is click the link down in the description below. So once you understand the active income side, the question is now, how do you convert this active income into more of a passive income? And again, this goes back to the risk versus reward. At the very lowest end, what is the easiest and most accessible way for you to generate some sort of return on the cash on this money that you've generated? And this would be through things like high interest savings accounts. At the time I'm recording this video, you have high interest savings accounts that are paying four to 5% in interest. That means you take the money that you have, you throw it into one of these savings accounts and you're generating four to 5% a year in interest. Your money is growing by four to 5% by doing nothing except sitting there. Now, the difference between a high interest savings account and something like buying an asset, stocks or real estate, is that you don't own an asset. I mean, your asset really here is just the cash. The cash is losing value. And to kind of combat the losing value, you have the interest. Versus buying an asset, something like stocks and real estate, the goal is to see long-term growth. Now, does this mean that you're always going to see growth in your asset? No. You see market crashes, you see economic recessions, and so there will be times where asset prices go down. But the goal is to buy it for the cash flow, that way whether the market's up or down, you continue to generate your cash flow. And over the long term, you want to see appreciation, meaning growth in the value of the asset. But the primary purpose is to generate the cash flow. So your high interest savings accounts, which you want to make sure it's FDIC insured, can give you a very accessible way to start generating some cash flow. I like to look at these as a way to park my cash, as a way to park my money until I can find an actual asset that I want to own. So now. Where are the other places where you can invest your money? Well, I've been talking about this throughout the video. You have things like stocks, and then you have things like real estate. Now, the right option for you is going to be what's best for you. I have both stocks and real estate. I like investing in both. But you got to figure out what is going to be the better investment option for you. When you invest in stocks, it's very accessible. You can go out and invest in individual dividend paying companies. You can invest in dividend paying ETFs. You can invest in dividend paying index funds. The whole idea here is you're going out and investing in something that is paying you with cash flow. But the thing that I want you to be aware of, especially when you're investing in stocks, is do not invest in anything, whether it's a stock or a fund, primarily based off of an analysis that shows you how much cash flow you're generating. Because if a company, let's just say, is trading for $50 a share and it's paying out a $5 annual dividend, that's going to show you a $5 cash flow a year. Now, that's the 10% annual cash flow return, which looks great. 10% cash flow, who wouldn't want that? Well, this doesn't show you the whole picture. Maybe the stock was trading at $250 not that long ago. And now, because it's on the verge of bankruptcy, its share price has been slashed. And so this is where you want to dig a little bit deeper. When you invest for cash flow, remember, you're not just buying the cash flow, although you want to make your decision, making sure that you're generating enough cash flow, but you are buying the asset and you want to make sure that the underlying asset is strong because you're buying a business, you're buying an asset, you're not just buying the cash flow. Now, of course, when you're buying this asset, you want to make sure that your cash flow is strong, but you have to do the analysis to understand that the cash flow that you're generating isn't something that's on the verge of bankruptcy. Because if it is, then you would lose all the money that you invested and the cash flow. So one way is stocks. And if you don't want to invest in individual companies, that's okay. You can invest in funds that will lower some of your risk and give you the ability to generate some of the cash flow. Generally, when you invest in funds, your cash flow is going to be a little bit lower because the risk is a little bit lower, but you have more protection. Now, remember, the way that you win here is you keep consistently investing your money. And this is where, again, you can make the decision of how much money do you want to invest in the cash flow today versus the active income. And you got to find the right balance for you. If for me in the beginning, it was all buying the cash flow. Now it's more of a balance. And you got to find what is the right balance for you. Same thing with real estate. 
Real estate works the same way. Real estate is a great wealth building tool. It's a great wealth storage tool. But the thing that so many people get confused is they think that they're going to become wealthy because they own real estate. When in reality is you got to kind of build that wealth first. You got to make that money first, then use that money to go out and buy real estate. And this is where people get caught up into the things like no money down real estate investing. No money down real estate investing has made me a lot of money, but not because of the way that you think. It has made me a lot of money because people will go into no money down real estate investing, get in over their head, get into foreclosure, and then be forced to sell by all other lenders. And that's where the lenders come to people like me and sell me that property at a discounted price. And so this is where now that financial education is important to understand now if you want to go out and invest in real estate, that's great. But there's risks involved. And not that you should let the risks stop you from wanting to do it, but that you have to understand the risks, be willing to learn, be willing to invest in your financial education, and again, make smart investment decisions. Make sure that you understand the type of cash flow that this property will produce, and is it enough cash flow? You see a lot of people that will go into real estate get excited because they think, oh yeah, maybe this property doesn't pay a lot of cash flow, but it's gonna double in value in just a few years, so I'm gonna be able to sell it for a huge profit. What if it doesn't? What if you can't sell it? And now what if you lose a tenant? What if a tenant damages the property? Now you're paying out of pocket on a property that isn't the value that you thought. And if it loses value, well then now not only can you not generate any income, but you can't even sell, you can't refinance, and you get very stuck. And this is where now, again, you got to understand your investing goals. But when it comes to cash flow, when it comes to the passive income, you need the active income in order to get the passive income. So before you put all your focus on how do I generate passive income without doing anything, without having any money, you got to have the active income first. There are five keys to being a successful real estate investor. Number one, you need to know how to find a good location. Number two, you need to know how to build a good team. Number three, you need to know how to run the numbers. Number four, you need to know how to do the due diligence on the property. And number five, you need to know how to increase the value of your investment. These are things that I learned over the last 12 years of investing in real estate, making a lot of expensive mistakes and seeing some success. So let me start by talking about number one, which is understanding the location. The four factors that you want to be paying attention to when you're looking at a good location is the crime in the area, the population and population growth, businesses moving in or out, and the walkability of the area, especially if you're looking at a city, a more urban environment where people can actually walk around places as opposed to a suburban environment where people have to drive places. So let me start by talking about crime. I mean, the general consensus is people want to be in a safe place. And so you can go do a Google search to see the crime in your neighborhood, see the crime in the city, see the crime in the county, and see the crime in the general area. And if you see crime increasing, that's a bad sign. If you see crime decreasing, that's generally a good sign because tenants want to feel that they're safe in your home. But you want to take this factor with a grain of salt because Manhattan has a lot of crime, but people want to live in Manhattan. California has crime. People want to live in California. Just because it's crime doesn't mean it's not a good place to invest. It's something that you want to be paying attention to if crime is rising or if crime is going down. And you're not always going to get a good answer by just searching crime scores and doing at crime maps on the internet. This is where you got to get the feel of a neighborhood where you're investing because real estate is very localized. And you don't want to just throw your money into an area because you think of something good that you found on Google. You want to actually drive the neighborhood, walk the neighborhood, stay there for a little while, and get the feel. You're not going to be able to get that real feel of the area without actually spending some time there. And if you want to actually be a real estate investor, you need to spend time in the areas that you are investing. If you don't live there, fine. Drive through it. Walk through it. Do you feel safe walking through it? And is it somewhere where you wouldn't mind spending some time? Second, on the population side, do a quick Google search of the city and neighborhood that you're looking to invest in and see the population. So go to Google, search Manhattan population. And what this will show you is the population and the population trend for Manhattan. And you can do this for different neighborhoods, different cities around the country. And what you want to see ideally is populations rising or at least populations staying stable. But you don't want to see populations dropping because if populations are dropping, that means that the amount of tenants in the area are probably also dropping. And you want to be investing in an area where more people are moving to because if there's more demand for your property in the future than there is now, 
that means that rent prices will probably have to go up because more people will want to live in the area that you own that real estate. Third, you want to be investing where businesses are moving to. So this is a little while ago now, but I remember I was looking at some real estate in a city that's near me and there was a city block that was completely vacant and it had some big real estate that was all vacant and it didn't look good and I asked the city about what was happening here and what they said is that a Walmart had just entered into contract to purchase all this land, to purchase the building and they were planning on opening a Walmart Supercenter. When I heard that, I started buying up some of the real estate near this area and over the next few years, not only did Walmart open up a Supercenter here, but then you had all these other new retail stores that opened up around the Walmart because Walmart brings a lot of traffic. People want to go to Walmart and so that opened up all these other new retail shops and then new real estate developments opened up on the other side of the street which was also vacant and this drove a whole new set of traffic and businesses into this area which meant more people wanted to be here, more people wanted to shop here, and more people wanted to live here, which not only increases the value of the real estate, but it also increases the rental prices of the real estate. Now, how do you find where businesses are moving to? Now, you can look at the press, you can look at the news, but many times, if it's already hitting the news, it might be a little bit too late, and this is where real estate is special because this type of insider trading, insider investing, is not illegal in real estate. In fact, it's completely legal. So how do you get this information? Well, one of the best places to go is actually the city hall. Just go to the city hall, the building department, and ask them if there are new businesses coming into a particular area. Is there some new developments coming? What's new happening in this city, in this neighborhood? And they'll tell you. And if you hear something interesting, that a big business is coming, that Amazon is opening a new Whole Foods, that Best Buy is doing something, that something is happening, I don't know why I said Best Buy, but something is happening here that's gonna be driving new demand, that's gonna be driving new businesses, that can create opportunity for you because now you can capitalize on the increase in real estate value in the area by owning some of the real estate and then when rent prices go up, well now you get to reap some of the rewards of that. And finally, you have walkability. So if you're investing in cities, walkability is extremely important because people want to be places where they have easy access to buses, easy access to subways, easy access to public transit, and easy access to food and groceries and everything around them. So walkability is extremely important when you're investing in in those types of city and urban areas but this is where you got to understand what type of investor do you want to be because you also have some investors that hate the idea of investing in big cities i know some investors that i work with that do the complete opposite they invest in more rural type areas and what they say is that one there's much less demand they're not competing against other investors and second the tenants that live there stay longer because they just live in these rural areas for much longer and people don't really move so it's a completely different game completely different demographic Graphic, but it creates opportunity for depending on what type of investor you want to be it creates opportunity for you if you know what the goals are if your goal is to be investing in the rural type areas you really got to know the neighborhood you really got to know the people and you're not going to have the same type of demand as you would in this heart of Manhattan and so you got to understand where do you want to be and the returns that you're going to get are also going to be different you have smaller returns in Manhattan generally if you're looking at a cash on cash investment because well, it's much more expensive to buy in Manhattan than in a village somewhere. But in that village, you're not going to have thousands of tenants and thousands of people that are willing to make applications to live in your place. So you're going to have higher vacancies and you're going to have higher wait times. And if you have a turnover, that can be more costly. So you have to understand where it is that you want to be or somewhere in the middle as a suburban investor. So there's many different types of investing and each one is going to have their own goals and have their own interests and tenants are going to want different things. If you're investing in cities, that's great but you gotta understand that what people want is walkability and something that will help you understand this is going to walkscore.com and you can see what the walkability is for a particular address and a particular neighborhood that we can see if that's somewhere where people would like to live. The last thing that I wanna mention on location and walkability is you can also consider investing where walkability will be increasing. Like in Detroit, there was a new rail that was put in and many investors started buying up land around where this new rail was going to go to start investing in this new walkability because this new rail was gonna create a new line of public transit and that would open up more opportunity for people to go from one place to the other. And so people started buying up the real estate all around it in anticipation for the new rail. But you just gotta make sure that it happens because if that new rail isn't as good 
as though people would expect, then you might be buying up this real estate and then find out that it's not as valuable as you would like. So you got to be careful with that type of speculation because there are risks involved with it, but it can create opportunity if you see the walkability increase. The reason why location is first is because you can change everything about a property except its location, which is why location is so important. Now this brings me to number two, which is understanding your team. And I'm going to be highlighting eight different team members that you need to have if you're going to be investing in real estate. This is your property manager, your real estate broker, your accountant, your contractor, your attorney, your banker, your title company, and your insurance company. Let me start by talking about your property manager because either your property manager is going to make your life completely miserable or they're going to make your life very free and clear. I have worked with a lot of property managers. Some of them are great. Some of them are very, very bad. And the bad ones will make your life literally a nightmare. My first property manager that I ever had, I don't even know if they were a real licensed property manager or not, but my tenant had my phone number and so my property manager did nothing. They were collecting the rent, they were collecting their fees, but my tenants would call me anytime something went wrong. Now, the whole purpose of a property manager is to make real estate passive for you. When you buy the property, you're supposed to give them the keys and then they're going to manage everything. They're going to find the tenant, they're going to make sure the tenant pays, they're going to make sure the bills are paid, they're going to handle all disputes with the city, with the tenant, and everything in between, and then they're going to take a small fee. This fee might be somewhere between 4% to 10 or 11% of your gross rental income, depending on how many units you have, depending on how much work that they're going to do. Now, this is a cost to you, but it also saves you a whole bunch of time because now the real estate whole investing process can be completely passive on your end, and your job is to be a real estate investor, not a real estate manager, which is why I never manage my own properties, but my first property manager was a property manager who was supposed to make it passive for me, but it was anything but passive. So I was getting calls from my tenant, I was dealing with all the issues, and eventually I fired this property manager, then I got another property manager. Now the second property manager was a lot better. They documented everything. I had a lawsuit happen in one of my real estate properties where a tenant sued my real estate company because they said that the bathtub got too slippery when the water was on and it caused them to slip and fall because the bathtub was too slippery. Well, anyways, that case got thrown out because ultimately they figured it out that the tenant didn't slip in the bathtub, the tenant ended up slipping at a barbecue, they were just trying to go after some money and they did get some money, but the tenants actually didn't get any money because my insurance company settled with them and they didn't make enough money to even pay the attorney fees, so the tenants ended up getting nothing, but that's real estate and that's the way the world works, especially here in America. We are the most litigious country in the world, so you have to be prepared for these types of things. Well, having a good property manager can definitely help with that because one of the things a property manager is supposed to do is document everything. Every time your tenant has any sort of communication with the property manager or with the contractor, this needs to be documented. And if you are the one that's documenting everything, well, it's going to be a huge pain in the asset. This is why I don't recommend you doing that. This is where you want to have a good property manager to do that. Well, that same property manager company had some changes internally and then they started not really managing properties. I had a property, and this is here in Michigan, where it gets cold. I had a property that didn't get winterized because when it gets cold in the northern states, you have to winterize properties. That way pipes don't burst when tenants are not there and when the heat is not on. Well, this property was not winterized and then a pipe burst because, well, nobody was there and for some reason the heat didn't work. And now the pipe burst and the whole property got destroyed and nobody knew about it. This property just kept flooding and flooding and flooding. And then eventually somebody from the property management team went out there to go show the property to get it leased out. And then they see that this property is completely flooded and this created a huge mess. Well, that property management company then had to pay me a lot of money and then I fired them. So this is where you have to make sure that you have a good property manager. Now, how do you find a good property manager? Well, you have to ask them a lot of questions. One, how are they getting paid? Some people say that it's very bad to pay a property manager a flat fee because now they're getting paid even if a property is vacant. I've had different experiences where it's not that big of a deal if a property manager charges you a flat fee so long as they do a good job. I don't like when property managers are going to charge you a fee to then do any sort of construction work. What that means is a property manager is going to do all the repairs or they're going to go find a contractor to do the repairs. You're going to have to pay for the repairs. That's the way it works. But then if the property manager is charging you a fee to then manage and issue the repairs, that I don't like. 
because many times what I've seen happen in the past with myself as well is when a property manager is charging you a 10% fee on top of whatever the repair is, they're not going to have the best incentive to go out and get you multiple bids to find you the lowest price possible to do a renovation to fix a deal because the more that you have to pay, the more the property manager makes. So I don't like that. Second, when it comes to the way that they handle tenants, you need to understand what are their policies when it comes to issuing the eviction notices? What are their policies when it comes to being lenient on tenants? Because you want to make sure that whatever their policies are align with you and you need to make sure how you get paid when there's a late fee. Who gets that money? Is it the property manager or is it you? I don't think it should be the property manager. I think it should be you. Maybe the property manager takes a little bit if they're going to be issuing notices for the late fee or because the tenant's late. But that's money that you should be receiving not your property manager. So you want to be asking these questions and understand what their protocols are and know where you can find all the information about your properties, about your leases, and about your P&Ls, your profits and losses. That needs to be figured out early on. So ask these questions to your property manager. Second, when it comes to your broker, the biggest mistake that I see real estate investors making is they try to find a real estate agent who is well known, a good real estate agent, and then they want them to represent them to find them real estate deals. Well, a regular real estate agent is helping people buy and sell the home that they live in. They're not helping real estate investors find a real estate investment deal because a real estate investment deal is very different than the home that you're going to be living in. And that real estate agent who's going to be sending you deals is going to show you deals that somebody would want to live in but not something that you want to invest in. And these are completely different deals because a cute home is going to give you cute profits. And you got to decide, do you want the cute profits or do you want the big profits? And it's going to be a completely different way of the way that you look at deals, the different way that you look at properties, different locations, different types of properties, because somebody who wants to live in a home might not want to buy a beat up property. But that beat up property can make you much bigger returns if you come in and renovate it because you'll be able to buy that property for a huge discount and then you can fix it up and then rent it for a better price because now you have a fully renovated property and you got it at a discount. So you want to make sure you have a broker that specializes in real estate investment deals. And even if you are a real estate licensed salesperson like I am, I'm a licensed salesperson. I got licensed when I was 20. I used to work with uh, people who wanted to buy and sell homes. I worked with investors. I worked with a bunch of people, but I don't broker my own deals. I have another broker that I work with. I go look at the properties. I'm licensed so I can go and do that. But then when I want to do up the paperwork and do all that stuff, I call up a broker and I have them fill out the paperwork and then they send it to me and then I sign it and send it back to them. That way my work is less. I want it to be as passive as possible for me. So I have a broker that I work with that does all of my contracts and that way now he takes a piece of his commission. I still get a little bit of commission and I just put that into the deal because I am a broker. But this is where understanding what are your goals? Do you want to be doing all the work to find the research, to find the properties, or can you hire somebody to do that? And that's where a good broker can help. Then you need a good accountant. I cannot tell you how valuable a good accountant is because I've had a bad accountant and I've had a good accountant. And if all your CPA is doing is filing your taxes, you are leaving a lot of money on the table. And if you are going to be investing in real estate, you absolutely need a good accountant now because now it's not just showing your W-2. There are so many different deductions, so many different things that you can do in real estate to allow you to make money and pay less money in taxes legally. And your accountant has to understand and specialize in real estate investments because there is so many different types of deductions, so many different legal loopholes that you can use with real estate that will allow you to pay less money in taxes legally. And you want to bring the accountant on and make them informed from the early stages. As soon as you buy the property, that's when you need the accountant to understand what's going on because there's so many different things that you can do when it comes from, from buying the property to doing the depreciation to potentially doing accelerated depreciation to then potentially offsetting some of the income that you make outside of real estate through the real estate that you're buying. So talk to an accountant about the different strategies that you can use where you use real estate to offset some of your other income and where you use real estate to generate cash flow but pay less money in taxes legally. Fourth, you need a contractor. Again, 
I've learned this the hard way because I've had good contractors and I've had very bad contractors. And very bad contractors will save you a lot of money right now. But if things go wrong, then not only are you going to have to pay to fix their work, but then you're going to have to pay to do the work right. And I have dealt with this on multiple occasions because in the beginning when I was getting started, I found the cheapest of the cheap contractors and they did work cheaply, sometimes quickly, sometimes not so quickly. But it's such a pain where you have to stand over them every single day to make sure they're at your property, to make sure they start working. And then when they're not working, you got to call them to see where they are because then they start another job in the middle of your job get a good contractor it's going to cost you a little bit more but it's going to save you so much headache it's going to save you so much time and it's going to save you money in the long run because when you have to keep paying to fix up your previous contractor screw-ups it really starts to add up and then it makes tenants upset because things keep breaking because your contractor didn't fix it the right way so now i work with a licensed and insured contractor and yes, they charge me more money, but it costs me way less headache and my things get done correctly the first time. Pay more to do it right the first time because if you don't, well, five years later, you're going to understand why it's way cheaper to have a good contract to do it right the first time. You all learn. Everybody learns at some point. Then you need a good insurance person because guess what? As a landlord, you need a good insurance. You need landlord's insurance and you need liability insurance. I talked about the time that I got sued because a tenant claimed that the bathtub was too slippery when the water was on. And well, I had to go through my insurance because now you need an attorney. Someone is going to charge $300 to $500 an hour who is going to sit there and defend you. Now, even though I was right, somebody still had to pay the attorney hours worth of work to go through the whole process to get this case settled and dismissed. And yes, we had to go through a settlement because it was stupid. The judge wouldn't see it. The judge said settle this outside of court, but you still needed an attorney to do that. And then the insurance company had to give the other party some money so they go away. The tenants who were suing me didn't make a penny, but we still had to go through this whole process because that's the way the system works. It's crazy, I know, but this is why you need insurance. So make sure you have landlord's insurance, make sure you have liability insurance, and it doesn't hurt to spend a little bit of extra money to up the insurance because we live in a very litigious country. Then you need your title insurance. Now, title insurance has been known to be one of the biggest wastes of money when it comes to insurance. Well, it is a waste of money that you hope becomes wasted because guess what? I've also dealt with title insurance issues. This is what happens when you go through a lot of real estate deals. Title insurance is something that protects what you buy. So if you buy a property, you think you're buying a home, what title insurance says is that you're actually buying the home that you think you're buying in case somebody from 10 years before comes and says, no, I own this property. You bought it from somebody who didn't actually own it. Title insurance is there to protect you against those types of situations. They are very, very, very rare but when they happen that's when title insurance can be valuable now title insurance is something you get typically when you just close on the property but you want to make sure that you have title insurance because there's sometimes when you go through auctions you go through foreclosures that you don't get this type of title insurance but you want to make sure that you get this because it can save you a huge headache I bought an apartment complex on a lake and this apartment complex was made up of four different parcels of land it was a beautiful area beautiful complex it was run down but I was coming in to renovate it and turn it around and I did and a few years after I purchased this property we fully turned the property around we put in a ton of money into this property and now it's fully rented because when I bought it it was completely vacant now this property is doing great and it's producing a lot of positive cash flow and then I get a letter from my attorney saying that apparently somebody else now owns a piece of my land and I said, what are you talking about? So somebody had a claim on this land and they had owned this claim to somebody else, a previous owner. And this never trickled down to me and the title company never discovered this. So whoever owned this property and had this loan on the property wasn't making payments because I no longer owned the property. And then the bank, the lender that was owed money from the property wasn't receiving money. So then they started issuing foreclosure notices. And where did they put these foreclosure notices? Somewhere on the property where nobody was going to see it. And so they put it on the property and they knew that nobody was going to see it because apparently that's the way the game works because they wanted to get the property. They didn't want the money. And this went on and on and on. And then eventually they put up enough notices and then they then got the right to the property. So now we get a letter saying, hey, you no longer own this piece of the property that cuts through some of the units, that cuts through some of the land. And now they say that we own this and that we have to pay them for it. So what did I do? I told my attorney, my attorney talked to my title company, and then my title company had to then settle with that previous owner. 
yes, it is very rare, but you don't want to have to deal with the headache if it does happen. Then you need a good banker. If you are financing your properties, you want to make sure you have a good banker that is going to be there to then help you get approved, to help you get the financing, and then who's not going to screw you over later on when things start to go wrong because the reality is the economy goes through ups and downs. And so banking, while it might seem just like a transaction, you need to borrow money from somebody else, it is a very much a relationship thing. So you want to make sure you know the person that you're working with, that they know you, they know your business model, they know your goals. So keep that relationship with your banker because they're going to be able to save you a whole bunch of headache later on. And just like anything else, else, you got to make sure you have a good attorney. Look, I am a licensed attorney and I don't do any of my own legal work. I have a number of different real estate attorneys that I work with, people who specialize in different things, and you want to make sure you have an attorney from the early stages of the deal. Even if you're buying a single family home or a condo, get an attorney early on board so they know what you're doing, so they can give you advice. That way maybe it's creating an LLC. That way they can make sure you don't miss the insurance part. That way you know you have all the things in place before you buy the property, that way you're protected legally, and that way your contracts are reviewed. And sometimes you might say, but it's just a standard contract. Yeah, well, sometimes it's not. And you want to make sure that nothing is sneaking through the contract that shouldn't be, that they make sure that your title insurance is what it should be, that they make sure that your closing is giving you exactly what you should be getting. So make sure you have a good attorney. The third thing that you have to do is run the numbers to make sure the deal makes sense financially. And you're going to always start with this, even if you're getting debt to buy the property. So you start with what you think the rent is going to be. Then you subtract the property taxes. And if you're going to be buying this property, you have to calculate if property taxes are going to be going up. Because if you're buying a single family home where somebody lived and now you're going to be renting it out, well, your taxes are going to go up because most cities charge higher taxes to landlords than to homeowners. And if the property value, the assessed value is going to be going up, well, your property taxes are also going to be going up. So you can talk to the assessor in the city and they'll give you a better idea of what your property taxes will be after you buy that. So just talk to the assessor, see what the property taxes will be. Then talk to a couple insurance agents to get an idea of what your insurance will be. You need insurance. So you subtract your property taxes, your insurance, your maintenance costs, now this maintenance cost is gonna be a number that you're gonna to have to calculate. If the property is older, if it needs more maintenance, you want a bigger number here. If it's newer, well, you don't wanna put zero, but something, a fraction of one month's worth of rent. So you could put a month's worth of rent or a fraction's worth of rent, depending on how new the property is and how much deferred maintenance is on the property. Then you're gonna subtract your management fee. Even if you're managing the property yourself, which I don't recommend, you still wanna pay yourself because you have to make sure that you factor in your time where if somebody else was going to do it, how much would they charge? So you got to make sure that the numbers make sense, even based off of yourself managing it. So if you are managing yourself, put in a number. If you have somebody else manage it, enter in what their number is. And then enter in a vacancy factor. Even if your property is fully leased out right now, eventually a tenant is going to leave and you're going to have to then re-tenant that. And when they leave, there's going to be a period of time where nobody is in there. So you want to make sure you enter in a vacancy factor. I like to typically put in one month's worth of rent. It depends on the economy. Sometimes it might be two months or a month and a half, just depending on where you are in the economic cycle. But enter in a vacancy factor. So now you start with your rent, you remove these expenses. This is your NOI. If this NOI is big enough, well, that's a good deal. If this NOI is negative, that's not a good deal. Now, how do you know if an NOI is big enough? Well, what I like to look at is I take this NOI number, this monthly NOI, multiply it by 12. So now you have an annual NOI number. This is how much profit you expect to make. Again, if you're using debt, we'll talk about that in just a second. But this is how much profit you expect the property to make over the year. And then you divide that by the price of the property. And this will give you something called the cap rate or the return on your property. And if that number is high enough, well, then that's a good deal for you. If it's not high enough, then you want to keep looking. And I'll show you what that means right now. And let's assume for the purposes of this video that you can buy this property right here for $100,000. And this property is going to rent out for, let's just say, $1,100 a month. And you have $500 a month worth of expenses. So you go through the same analysis that I just showed you, which leaves you with $600 a month of projected NOI, projected profit. Now, I'm going to take this $600 of monthly profit, multiply it by 12, which means that I'm going to have $7,200 of annual NOI, net operating income. That's what NOI stands for, or profit. Now, I'm going to take the $7,200 of annual profit, NOI, and I'm going to divide it by $100,000, which is the total price of the property, which gives me a 7.2% 
return. For me, that is a good deal. I look for anything more than 7% here as the initial rule of thumb when it comes to investing on money. If it's more than 7%, I will consider the deal. If it's under 7%, it's not a good enough return. Now, this return is going to depend from area to area. Some neighborhoods are much higher, some neighborhoods are much lower. You got to decide what is a good rate for where you are. But for me, I know that I want a 7% return. This is where now you have to do your debt analysis. Let me wipe this off and show you what that looks like. If in this case, you were to put down 20%, that would be $20,000. So now you put down $20,000, that's your equity, and you're going to be borrowing the other $80,000. And if you borrow the other $80,000, at say 7.5% interest. That means now your interest rate is going to be costing you $560 a month, which means you have a $40 a month profit now, which $40 a month times 12 is $400, $480. So $480 is your new profit. Now, the way that you're going to calculate your return now is you take your $480 that you're making in profit, and you're going to divide that by your equity, which is $20,000. Here now, it's about a 2.5% return on your money when you factor in debt, which isn't a very good return because now that you're getting debt, you have a higher risk because your higher risk is you have to make payments to your bank. So you want to be compensated for that. So you want a higher return here than you would if you just paid cash. And this is where you got to start with the cash analysis. Then you do the debt analysis and you want to make sure if everything makes sense. If the location is good, the numbers make sense. The next thing you want to move on to is the due diligence. This is after you enter into a contract to buy the property where you now review everything to make sure that everything is good. Now, before I go into the due diligence things that you want to work on, if you do want to stay up to date on what is happening in terms of real estate trends and stock trends and crypto trends and the economic trends, then you can join Market Briefs. It's my free newsletter that I created to help investors make better decisions. It's completely free and it's a simple breakdown that you can read in less than five minutes every morning that will help you understand what's happening in the financial markets. That way you can make better decisions with your money. So if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, I'll put the link to how you can join Market Briefs down in the description below. As soon as you enter into contract to buy a property, there's going to be five people that you want to call. One of them is not listed here. This person is whoever's going to be helping you finance the property, whether it's a bank, whether it's investors. You want to call them to make sure you can get the cash, but that's not really going to be your due diligence. The due diligence is going to be working with four people. One is your property inspector, one is your property contractor, one is your property manager, and fourth is the city. Let me start by talking about the inspector, because as soon as you enter into a contract to buy this property, you want to make sure that this property is what you think it is. And this is where you want to get a private property inspector who's going to be walking through the entire property to give you a report on the health of the property. You have to, have to, have to do this because I can tell you from experience that if you don't do this, you can run into a ton of mistakes. My worst deal ever was a deal where I trusted my contractor, who was not my property inspector, that I should go out and buy a property. He told me to buy a property because, well, he said that we could flip it for a quick return, and turns out that he really just wanted me to write him a check so we'd have some work to do because he was struggling financially. I ended up buying a property that was so run down that you couldn't see because it was covered up with a whole bunch of problems where the pipes were completely frozen because somebody had poured cement down the pipes where nothing worked, the HVAC units were shot, everything was just wrong in the property where it cost me tens of thousands of dollars, maybe more than what I expected because I did not get a property inspector to walk through the property, to look at the pipes, to look into the basement, to look into the foundation, to look into the attic, to make sure that the property is what you think it is. So do yourself and do me a favor, pay a few hundred dollars and get a good property inspector to walk through the property as soon as you enter into a contract to buy it before you actually close on it. That way you know what you're getting. Second. Get a good contractor to walk through the property because if you're going to be doing renovations, you need to know what it's going to cost you. And you know the price of things have always been fluctuating. So this is where as soon as you know what's wrong, you know what you need to make changes on and if you're going to do renovations, get your contractor to walk through the property so you know and 
estimate of what it's going to cost you to make the repairs. And if it's way more than what you thought, then you can back out of the deal. But if it's in line with what you thought, well, now you already have your quote. And as soon as you close, you can get the work started. Third, get your property manager to walk through the property. That way they can get an idea of what the property is. They can give you renovation ideas if things need to be upgraded because they should know the neighborhood. They should know the city. They should know what tenants want in the area. And they'll be able to give you a good idea of what you can get for the property in terms of rent. And then you can make sure that what you can get for the property is in line with what you expect. And fourth, get the city involved because you want the city to know that you're looking at buying this property, that you want to rent it out because maybe they're creating some new restrictions on new landlords. You want to know that before you enter buy the property. Maybe they have some outstanding liens. You want to know this before you buy the property. Talk to the city, see what needs to be done in terms of licensing because if they have their own requirements in terms of licensing, if they have different changes that they want to make, you want to know that beforehand because if you don't know that, it can end up costing you a fortune after you buy the property with a whole bunch of repairs and upgrades that you didn't know that you have to make. So talk to the city beforehand, before you close on the property, so you know what the total cost will be to turn the property around after you close the property. This is gonna be done in the due diligence phase of the property. You always wanna have a due diligence phase where you have time to do these types of inspections. If you don't do these inspections, you are taking on a huge, a huge, a huge risk. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this is because I made this mistake and it ended up biting me in the asset. So please don't make the same mistake that I did and get these inspections before you close on the property. And the fifth thing that you have to understand is how do you increase the value of your property? And for me, what that means is how do I increase the cash flow from the property? Because when I invest in real estate, my goal is not to flip the property for a big profit. My goal is to generate cash flow because I want enough cash flow for my real estate to be able to live my life that will now have this passive cash flow that I can use and I can live my life without having to worry about the cost because every month I'm going to get another cash flow check from real estate. So the question is now, how do you invest in your properties to increase the cash flow? And this is going to require research on your end and this is where a good property manager can help you. Just yesterday, I was talking to a property manager of mine and we were talking about an apartment complex that I own. And I was asking him what his thoughts are on buying another property and what the different options were and what my goals are. Because he knows that I'm looking for a 7% cash on cash return on my deals. And he said, you know, one of the things that we could potentially do is do a $250,000 investment into this particular investment complex. And what he says is that we will be able to increase our NOI by 11%. If I make this $250,000 investment by upgrading the bathrooms, by upgrading the kitchens, because according to him, he does the research. He's been looking at different properties. He manages different properties in the area. He sees that there's more upside in the area, but we need better units. We need better kitchens. We need better bathrooms. And so if we can make this investment to improve the property, it's going to cost me money today. I can use a 250 grand to go out and buy another property, but it's harder right now to find a good deal. But if I take that same money and invest it into my own own property, I can increase my rents, I can increase my NOI, and I can create a better property for my tenants. There's an unlimited number of things that you can do to increase the value of the property, but what you should do is going to depend on your market, and that's going to depend on what people are already willing to pay for. Now, you can be one of the people that's the trendsetter, you can be the person that's creating the new value, but typically, that's going to require either a lot of money because now you're going to be making a brand new development that's creating a brand new type of market in the area, or you're going to have something small and you're going to hope for somebody who wants an exceptional property that no one else is willing to pay for. I rather, if you're in the middle, I rather look at what other people are charging and make sure that I'm in line. That way I'm not overcharging people, I'm charging within the market, but I know that I have one of the best properties in the market. So look around. Are people having upgraded bathrooms? If so, what's in their bathrooms? Do people have upgraded kitchens? If so, what's in their kitchens? Do they have stainless steel appliances? I love putting stainless steel appliances in my units because most tenants, when they come from other properties, they have those ugly, old, dirty appliances. But people love stainless steel appliances and it doesn't have to cost you that much more to get a nice stainless steel appliance in your unit. Tenants love it, they're willing to stay longer, and many times you'll be able to charge a little bit more. If you can charge an extra $25 a month for your upgraded appliances, 
well, you might make your money back in three or four years. Kitchens, bathrooms, floorings, and ceilings can help you deliver a lot more value in your property, but you want to make sure it's in line with what's happening in your area. So if you don't want to be the person that's walking through the different properties for a lease in your area to see what's possible, then get a good property manager who's going to be doing this for you that can create a proposal about what needs to be done to increase the value of your properties. And then just naturally, when you upgrade a property, if it's a multi-unit property and you're making more money, it's going to be worth more money. And if it's not a multi-unit property and you upgrade a property, well, now your property is also going to be worth more money because you upgraded the property. Let's talk about investing for cash flow because unfortunately, there's a lot of, let's call it poo-poo information out there on the internet when it comes to the topic of cash flow investing because a lot of people say, oh, if you want to get rich, just get this passive income, create this drop shipping site, start this Amazon store, create this ebook, and you're going to be making passive income, this cash flow. But the reality is, number one, that's not passive. And number two, it is so difficult to generate generate this type of cash flow. The way that real cash flow investing works for investors and helping people become extremely wealthy with cash flow is like this. I'm going to draw you right here for my male followers. I'm going to draw you a mustache and for our female followers, I'm going to draw you a braid in my native language Punjabi. We call a mustache a much and a braid a gut. So now you go to work every single day at this job. Maybe this job is your business and then this job is going to pay you a salary. Now you're going to take a piece of the income that you did not spend at Gucci and Chipotle and you're going to take this money and you're going to invest it into this asset. Now this asset could be something like a dividend paying stock. It could be something like real estate. I'll talk about how you can do this in just a minute. But now you're going to take this money, put it into this asset that's going to be generally passive on your end. Not completely passive, but generally passive. And now that you own this asset, it is going to pay you with cash flow. Maybe you get a check every month. Maybe you get a check every three months. Maybe you get a check once a year. Just depends what this asset is. And now you can take this money that you're generating and you can either buy more of these assets that are gonna pay you with more cash flow, or you can take this money and use it to go out and buy you a brand new car. That's gonna be your choice, but this is how real cash flow investing works. Now, the thing that you need to understand about cash flow investing that nobody wants to talk about on the internet is that you don't get rich by investing for cash flow. You got to be rich first to get a lot of the cash flow that will make you wealthy. The reason why is because you got to take the money that you're earning that you don't spend at Chipotle and Gucci, and then you take this money to buy these assets. So you need the money to generate the cash flow in the first place. And this is why it's so difficult, is because people hear of this idea of generating passive income and cash flow, and it sounds very exciting. But the reality is when you generate this cash flow, you're generating a return on the money that you invest. So let's assume, I'm going to be very generous here. Let's assume that you can get a 10% cash flow return. That's very high, by the way. But let's assume you can get a 10% cash flow return. That means if you invested $1,000 into this asset, you're going to generate $100 after one year of cash flow. $100 from $1,000 is not going to really pay you much. I mean, it's not going to fund really anything in your life. Even if you invested $100,000, then you're only generating $10,000 a year. Now, $10,000 a year is a lot, but it's not even $1,000 a month. It's not life-changing money for you to go out and start driving a Rolls Royce. You need the money to invest to generate the cash flow. This is where people say, but Jasprit, if I need millions of dollars to generate a lot of cash flow, What's the point of me even doing that? Well, the point isn't for you to go and invest into this cash flow asset today and never do it again. The point is you go to work every single day. You get this paycheck every week, every two weeks, every month. Every time you get paid, you're going to take a little bit of this money and buy this asset. Now, when you do this week after week after week, month after month after month, year after year after year, decade after decade, now you're going to be building a solid stream of cash flow, especially if you're taking this cash flow that you're generating and using it to buy more assets because now you're making money to buy cash flow and the money that your money makes is buying you more cash flow as well. And now if you do this for long enough, now you're going to be able to build a solid stream. Now the more money you invest into this asset, the more cash flow you're going to be able to generate. And this is why I call it the decade of sacrifice. Because if you put in a decade of time where you're working to live smaller so you have more money here, and then you take this money and you use it to buy these assets that are paying you with cash flow, 
Well, now, after a decade of sacrifice, you are going to be able to reap the rewards of that, which is now you're going to finally have a solid stream of cash flow. So if you want to go through this decade of sacrifice, which is not easy, I mean, it's the reason why the majority of people will never become financially successful or wealthy. The majority of people do not want to make this financial sacrifice of you working to live smaller and earn more money, not so you can drive a BMW, not so you can buy all the fancy Gucci, not so you can have a big home, but so you can have more assets. And if you put in that work to own more assets that are paying you with cash flow, now you got the checks coming in every month, every quarter, every year, and now you have this money coming in without you physically working because remember, you gotta work here to get this check. You don't gotta work here to get this check. This asset cash flow is coming in passively. The only thing you gotta do here is make sure that your assets are still good, making sure that you still own a good portfolio of stocks, making sure that your real estate is still good. All you gotta do here is monitor it. Here, you gotta go into the office or go into work and keep getting that paycheck because if you don't work, you don't get that paycheck. Here, if you don't work, you still get paid. But in order to get paid here, you got to keep contributing money here week after week, month after month, year after year for at least a solid decade. And if you do that, now you're going to have a brand new stream of income that can allow you to drive that nice car without worrying about the price. You have the money coming in here that will allow you to go on those vacations and not have to worry about the price. You got the money coming in here to buy the fancy clothes. And you don't got to worry about paying for it because it's your assets that are paying for it. It's not what you are working to pay for. This is how wealthy people really become wealthy because if you can build this type of cash flow, well now you have true financial freedom because now you have assets that are paying for your lifestyle instead of just you working to pay for your lifestyle. So what are these types of assets that you can invest in that way you can generate this type of cash flow? Now I'm gonna go over mainly two types of assets. I'm gonna talk about stocks and I'm gonna talk about real estate because these are probably the two most accessible ways for the average person to generate this type of cash flow. When you go out and you invest in a company in the stock market, what you're doing is you're literally buying a business. If you go out and you buy one share of the Amazon company, you become one of the owners of the Amazon company. If you go out and you buy one share of the Apple company, you become one of the owners of Apple. If you go out and you buy one share of Chipotle, you become one of the owners of Chipotle. If you go out and you buy one share of Sweetgreen, you become one of the owners of Sweetgreen. You get the idea. Now you're literally buying one of the pieces of ownership in that business instead of just buying a product that this business sells. Most people just think about businesses as their products. You go and buy things on Amazon. You buy the newest iPhone. You buy a Chipotle bowl. You buy a sweet green salad. That's how most people are wired to think. When you go out and you invest in a stock, now you're actually buying the business instead of the product. Well, some companies in the stock market, not all of them, but some companies on the stock market pay what's called a dividend. A dividend is a cash payment that you get as an investor for doing nothing except owning the stock. Now again, not every company pays out a dividend. And the reason why is because for a company to pay out this dividend, they have to have a big profit. So now when a company makes a profit at the end of the year, there's three things that they can do with this cash. Number one is they can save this money in case of an emergency. Number two is they can reinvest this money back into the company. Or number three is they can just give it away to you, one of the shareholders, one of the owners. Now, when it comes to saving the money in a company, you gotta think from the perspective of a business owner. If a company makes $100 million of profit and they kept $100 million in their bank account, well, there's dead cash sitting there. Not every company wants a ton of dead cash sitting there because the $100 million isn't generating a return for the company. Companies want to do something with their money or at least give this money to their owners. And so if a company has a big enough bank account or a big enough savings account, they might not wanna save more money which then brings us to option two, which is reinvest the money back into the company. Now, if it's a smaller startup growth company, you bet they're gonna wanna invest all of this money, maybe and some more through debt and other investment money back into the company because they wanna grow bigger. They wanna expand their market share. They want to be a larger company. And when a company is trying to grow, they're gonna be investing everything that they can to open new stores, open new manufacturing plants, open new research and development facilities. That way they can keep expanding and growing their market share. But when a company becomes even bigger, and now you're a much larger conglomerate, and you don't really see that opportunity to keep investing and growing as quickly, now you might not want to reinvest all this money back into the company, which leaves now this cash back in the bank account. And if you don't want to just save it, well then you can give this money away to the shareholders, people like you who own a piece of the stock. Now this is called a dividend. 
and companies that pay a dividend generally pay out this dividend quarterly, meaning every three months. So now, if you buy a stock that's paying a dividend, that means you're gonna get a cash payment every three months for doing nothing except owning the stock. Now, does this come with risk? Of course. If you invest in a company on its way to bankruptcy, well, eventually they might cut that dividend or they'll have to cut that dividend. Plus, you can also see the value of that stock fall. And this is where you have to understand how to value an investment and know how to research a good stock. And you might be saying, but just breathe. I don't want to do all that. I don't want to keep up with the company. I don't want to research the stock. I don't know how to do that. I don't want to research the financials. That's okay. You don't have to. The alternative to investing into an individual company is to invest in something like a fund, maybe a dividend paying ETF, a dividend paying index fund, a dividend paying mutual fund. Now, instead of investing in one company, like let's just say Apple, now you can invest into a basket of companies that have say 500 different companies in here and Apple is just one of the companies and there's 499 other dividend paying companies in here. So now you can go out and find these dividend paying funds. Again, you have ETFs, mutual funds, index funds. You go out and find one of these dividend paying funds that invest in companies that are paying a dividend. Now you invest in one thing that's investing in 500 different companies. Now you can lower your risk because if Apple were to go bankrupt, well, now you have 499 companies to balance it out. This way you can lower your risk and keep getting those dividends that way now you can just keep throwing your money into one of these funds. So this is option one. You can invest into an individual company. I am not telling you what to invest in. Just giving you an example. You can invest into an individual company that's paying a dividend, or you can invest into a fund that's paying a dividend. But again, the key is you got to just keep reinvesting that money. Option number two is you invest in real estate. Now you're going to go out and buy a property. Maybe it's a house, maybe it's an apartment complex, maybe it's an office building if that's something you're into, maybe it's a retail building, maybe it's a mixed use building, maybe it's a storage building. You're going out and you're buying this property, but you're not buying it to live in or use yourself. You're buying it to rent out to somebody else. So now you buy this property, you rent it out to somebody else, maybe they'll live in or use this property, and then in exchange for them living in and using your property, they pay you rent. Now the key here is this rent has to be enough to cover your property taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, your management fees, any vacancy costs, and then if you have any debt, cover that as well, and then put some money in your pocket each and every month. That's the right way to invest in real estate. You have some people, especially when you're in a very hot seller's market like we've been seeing, when you're in a very hot seller's market, you will see investors go out who have a lot of cash, just go out and buy properties and say, you know what, I'm okay losing money every single month because I think this property is gonna be more valuable next year. So I'll be able to flip it for a profit. That's not the game that I play. That's too risky, that's too speculative because I have no idea where housing prices or real estate prices are gonna be in a year. I don't like to play that game. What I like to do is I wanna make sure I can make a profit in my cash flow every single month and just keep working to accumulate the cash flow. I just wanna keep stacking the cash flow because now I know, okay, this property is gonna make me $250 a month. If this property is gonna make me $250 a month, I gotta buy a second one for another $250 a month. After 10, I got $2,500 a month coming in in profit. After 100, I got $25,000 coming in in profit. And now it's a game of just stacking cash flow and how fast can I stack that cash flow. Now again, you don't have to be a real estate investor. You don't have to invest in stocks but you have to start putting your money to work if you wanna start generating the cash flow. There's some people on the internet that say that the only way to build wealth is to invest in real estate. Well, there's a lot of people that have become extremely wealthy without ever touching real estate. You have some people that say, you have to go out and invest in the stock market if you want to be wealthy. Well, there are some investors that only invest in real estate that have never touched the stock market that have become extremely wealthy. What you need to do is find the right balance for you. Personally, I invest in stocks and I invest in real estate. It's just something that I'm interested in. You don't have to go out and blindly follow anybody else. You don't wanna be a sheep. The idea is for you to go out and build your financial education, learn how to invest, and find the right strategy that works for you, that works for your family, and that works for your financial goals. Because at the end of the day, if you want to invest your money, you just want to make sure you get the best returns. For me, I like cash flow because cash flow is something that I can predict. And when I got the cash flow coming in, well, now I know I can go out and spend my money, at least the cash flow that I'm generating, and I don't really have to worry about it because even next month, I'm going to get another cash flow check. 
That's the way that I like to run my finances. So if you want to invest your money, you gotta figure out the right strategy for you. And well, this goes over a couple ways that you can invest your money for cash flow. If you wanna get your finances in order, the first thing you need to do is not hire an expensive money coach or financial planner or financial advisor. The first thing you need to do is just track your money. Once you're tracking money, you want to make some adjustments to how you're spending your money. Once you make those adjustments, make sure you're implementing those adjustments and then rinse and repeat. As you start to get your money in order, that's when you can start doing the fancy stuff. Maybe getting a financial advisor, maybe getting a money coach, maybe reading a whole bunch of financial books. Maybe then start going out and figuring out how you want to invest your money. But the very first thing you got to do is you got to start tracking your money. And that means I want you just to go out and get a piece of paper, get a Google sheet, use an Excel sheet, does not matter. And at the very top, you got to write your income. Now, if you have multiple sources of income or if you have multiple incomes in your household, Write them down here. Where is your money coming in from? Is it your job, your W-2? Is it your side hustles? Is it your business? Is it your investment income? Wherever the income is, write it down right here. That way you know exactly how much money you made over the last month. You wanna do this month by month, that's probably the easiest way to do this. Then, once you got a total number for your income, the next thing you wanna do is you're gonna write down your expenses. Now, same concept. You're gonna take out your bank statements, you're gonna take out your debit card statements. You're gonna take out your credit card statements. I want you to take a look at all of your expenses. And the reason why it's easier for you to use a Google Sheet or Excel Sheet is because it's gonna be easier for you to categorize these a little bit later on. But if you like paper, that's fine. Now, take out all of these and you need to know exactly where every penny went. How much money did you spend on restaurants? How much money you spend on groceries? How much money you spend on vacations? How much money you spend on your rent or your mortgage? How much money did you spend on your utilities? How much money did you spend on Netflix and everything in between? Write each one of these down. Then ideally you will categorize these and then you're gonna write down your total expenses. Then below that, you're gonna write your other numbers here. How much money did you save? How much money did you invest? And how much money did you give to charity? Once you have this right here, now you have a financial spreadsheet showing you what's going on with your money. Because most people, and I'm just saying this generally, I'm saying this statistically, most Americans, the vast majority of Americans, have absolutely no idea of how much money they're making, how much money they're spending, where they're spending the money, how much are they saving, and how much are they investing, and how much are they giving to charity. Start with this. Once you do this, I can immediately guarantee that as soon as you see this, you're gonna wanna make some adjustments. I don't even have to tell you what to do. And the reason why is because when you do this, you're grading yourself and you're gonna see, holy crap, how much money did I just spend at restaurants last month? How much money did I spend going out on my car last month? How much money did I spend on groceries last month? And immediately, you're gonna start making some changes. Because when you see how much money you spend at groceries, maybe you're gonna start creating a grocery list. And you're gonna say, unless it's on my grocery list, I don't buy this thing at the grocery store. If you see that you spent $600 at Benihana's last month, you're gonna say, okay, I'm not eating out this month. I'm gonna go and cook my own meals this month. So I don't wanna give you a blanket statement of how you start spending your money yet, because I want you to number one, track your money. Then number two, I want you to make adjustments on how you wanna start spending your money. And these adjustments that you make are gonna depend on what your financial statements look like. Then number three is I want you to actually implement these things. That means now you have the statement for last month. What do you think you're gonna do next month? Yes, you're gonna do this again. That means month after month, and it shouldn't take you that long after you do it the first time. The first time, it's gonna take you the longest. The second time, it's gonna take you a little bit less time. But by the third time, you're gonna be able to do it in 15 to 30 minutes. Every month, you wanna make a little sheet of how much money you're making and what's going on with your money. That way you can understand what's going on with your money because it's gonna help you make better decisions with your money. Then, it's number four, rinse and repeat. Because now what's gonna happen is once you take a look at this two months down the line, you're gonna have a much better financial grasp of your money. You're gonna see how much money you're making. You're gonna know what your expenses are like. You're gonna have a better control of your expenses. And now you're gonna be looking at how can I optimize my expenses? How many of these bills can I renegotiate? How many of these bills can I get rid of because I'm not using them before? Can we downsize the car? Do we really need a car this expensive that takes premium gas that has $782 a month just in the monthly payment without including all the other fees? Can you downgrade on these items? And these are the questions you're gonna start answering when you get to month two and month three, and I don't have to tell you what to do. You have to start with this, if you wanna get your finances in order, because most people's financial statements look like this. You make money, you spend money, and then you wonder where all of your money went. 
And then everybody says, oh, okay, well, I'm making some money. I got to get my money in order. I have no real wealth. I have no real investments. I want to get my life in order. I want to have some cash in the bank. Maybe I should start investing my money. And so now you have this financial statement going on right here. And then the next thing that people do is they go open a stock brokerage account. Now I'm going to start throwing some money to the stock brokerage. You put aside $1,000. And now you put $1,000 into the stock brokerage account and you can say, I'm now going to become wealthy with this $1,000 investment. What stock should I buy? And now you go out and buy a stock that you read online that you think is a good investment. And then when the stock goes down in value to $780, you wonder what the heck is going on in the world. You thought that investing was supposed to make you richer, but now you just lost 200 some dollars by putting your money into what you thought was a good investment. This is how most people become and stay broke. It's not because you're not investing your money to the right places is because you have no system of what to do with your money. Once you got this in order, the next thing you want to do is create a few different bank accounts. I like to say that you need to have at least three different bank accounts. A bank account for your spending money, a bank account for your savings money, and a bank account for your investments money. And the reason why you want to keep these in separate bank accounts is because if you keep all of your money in one bank account, how do you know which money is supposed to be invested? which money is supposed to be saved for an emergency and which money is supposed to be spent. And you might say, oh, I'm good with the money. I know that this $3,000 that's in there is just for my savings and this $8,000 there is for my investments and the other money I can spend. Well, when it's all in one bank account, it's very easy to accidentally spend your savings money and it's very easy to accidentally finance your investment money. And this is why you want to go out and create three different bank accounts. And what you can do now, thanks to technology, is many banks will allow you for free to create an automatic withdrawal and deposit. That way now when you get paid in one bank account, you can automatically have some of this money move to your second bank account. So you have three different bank accounts. This is where all your money gets deposited when you get paid. Then anytime you get paid, you can create an automatic withdrawal and deposit. That way a percentage of this money goes into your investment money and a percentage of this investment goes into your savings account. Now you're separating your money that way you cannot accidentally spend your investing money and you can't accidentally spend your savings money. Now this is where everybody asks, well, how do I invest my money and where do I invest my money? I'm not going to go too deep into investing in this video, but we have a full ebook on how do you invest your money at Briefs Media titled How to Build Wealth as an Investor. And this starts from the basics of how do you build the mindset of an investor to how do you save your first couple thousand dollars, but then it gets a little bit more advanced going over different investing ideas. How do you invest for cash flow? What are different investing strategies? To how do you spend your money smartly? To then how do you earn more money? To then how do you protect your assets? There's a ton of value in this ebook. You can read this ebook completely for free. All you gotta do is click the link down in the description below or go to briefs.co slash ebook. The biggest shift here when it comes to getting a hold of your finances, turning your money around and becoming wealthy isn't just creating some financial system and building some financial education. It's also about the mindset of money. Because a lot of times we grew up with no financial education and no idea of how we're supposed to use and spend our money. And so most people assume now when you start making money is you got to go out and spend your money. This is America's consumerism mentality. Hate it or love it, that is what it is. And it's great for people who understand this because now you own the businesses, you own the investments that profit when people spend their money. But when you don't understand this, you're the one that's spending all their money, going into debt to make the rest of the country rich at your expense. And that's why it is so important for you to understand this because if you don't understand this, you're the reason why everybody else gets to drive around in the nice cars. You're the reason everybody else gets to fly around in the private jets and fly first class. You're the reason everybody has those nice homes. It's because you keep spending all of your money. It's because you keep going into debt to make other people rich before you make yourself rich. That means, number one, if you have $1,000 in your bank account, you can't go out and spend $1,000. And that means if you have $1,000 in your bank account, you cannot afford a $1,000 jacket. You cannot afford a $1,000 handbag. You cannot afford a $1,000 iPhone. Because there's a difference between being able to afford something and being able to buy something. See, most people assume that if I got $50 in the bank and I want to buy a $1,000 phone and it's a $40 a month payment, I can afford the phone because I can afford the $40 monthly payment. But being able to afford something and being able to make the monthly payments are two completely different things. And now, if you want to be able to actually afford it, that means you got to be able to buy the whole thing without having to finance it. The only exception to this that I would make is the home that you live in. But now, when it comes to buying things like a phone, buying things like a car, buying things like a sofa, buying things like a TV, stop financing it. Buy it with cash. Yes, including that car too. The reason why so many Americans are broke, if you had to just pick one item, it's because of how much money people are spending on their car. More and more Americans now have a $1,000 
monthly car payment. I think it was 20% of all Americans who have a car payment have at least a $1,000 a month car payment. That is a whole rent payment for a lot of the country. So now when you're spending $1,000 a month just on the car payment, the next thing you gotta pay for is the expensive gas. The next thing you gotta pay for is the expensive insurance. The next thing you gotta pay for is the expensive oil changes. And then the next thing you gotta pay for is the expensive maintenance on top of all of that. So it's not just a $1,000 a month car payment you gotta pay, now you're paying $3,000 a month just to keep up with this car. So now if you wanna break out of that, go out and buy a used car with cash. If you were gonna put $8,000 down to go out and finance this nice car, take the eight grand, go out and buy a car with cash. Yeah, it's not as nice, but you don't gotta worry about the payments. Now you take those payments and you reinvest it back into yourself. But then you're gonna say, but just breathe, if I have $1,000 in my bank account, why can't I buy a $1,000 jacket or a $1,000 iPhone or a $1,000 handbag? I mean, if I have $1,000, I can actually afford it, right? Well, kind of. Yeah, you can buy it, but if you really want to be able to afford it, you can't spend all your money to buy this thing. That's why one of the things I like to follow is a simple rule of five, which says if you cannot buy five of them, you cannot afford one of them. Now, you start to really change the way you think about spending your money. If you got $1,000 in your bank account, that means the most you can buy is a $200 phone, or a $200 jacket, or a $200 handbag. And that way now you're not spending all of your money. It changes the way you think. Now at first you're gonna say, well how the heck am I supposed to afford a lifestyle if I start to live so much smaller? Well, you'll find a way. Because if the government were to tax you tomorrow, impose a brand new 30% tax on your income, what are you gonna do? You're gonna kick, complain, scream, cry, and then you're gonna find a way to pay it. And that's exactly what you gotta do right now, is you gotta find a way in the beginning to live smaller. Now, I'm gonna say this again, the goal is not to live small for the rest of your life. The goal is not to sit there and pinch pennies for the rest of your life. Pinching pennies is never gonna make you wealthy. Because at the end of the day, a penny saved is just a penny. But you gotta start by understanding how to control your spending before you start worrying about how you can earn more money because if you start earning more money without knowing how to control the spending, well now you end up in a bigger financial hole. And this is what we see happen for so much of America, is people work to get a raise, they work to get a promotion, they work to get a bonus, you make some more money, now you start driving a faster car. You live in a bigger home. You go on a more expensive vacation because you make more money. And this is where you gotta understand why you're working to make more money. Because what wealthy people are doing in this economic system is you're working to make more money to buy more investments. And if you can buy more investments, these investments will continue to make you money because of the way our economic system works. And now if these investments are making you more money, well now you can take the money your investments make and start to use that to live a bigger lifestyle. And this takes time to do. The reason why so many people don't wanna do this is because, well, it's gonna take me a long time to start making any money from my investments. And you're 100% right. That's why I call it a decade of sacrifice. But if you can put in that decade of living smaller and working to earn more money, that way you can invest more aggressively, after a decade, you're gonna have a whole new stream of income, maybe a whole new asset that's producing more money for you that you can start using to live a better life. But most people are not willing to put in that time. Most people are not willing to put in that work. Most people are not willing to put in the effort or make those sacrifices. And that's why most people will never become wealthy. And that's why most people will continue to complain and hate the system. Now, the problem with that is, that's never gonna actually help you with your financial situation. Complaining and hating and bringing everybody else down and bringing down the rest of the world, it's not gonna help you feed your family. It's not gonna help you take your kids to Disney World. It's not gonna help you buy your spouse the handbag that he or she wants. If you wanna be able to have the nice things financially, you gotta go out and get more money. And that means you gotta understand how to use your money smartly. That's the first step. And that means number one, you gotta understand how to track your money. Once you can start tracking your money, you make the adjustments, you start implementing and you keep working on this, then you gotta figure out how can you control the spending. Once you can figure out how to control the expenses, because now you got the income coming in, you gotta control these expenses so you have more money to invest, then is how can you earn more money? And this is where things start to get fun. Because now the question is how do you go from $40,000 a year to $400,000 a year? And at first you might hear that and say, how in the world can somebody like me go from 40 to 400? That doesn't make any sense. But when you start asking that question, you're gonna start looking for new answers. Now you're gonna start watching different YouTube videos. You're gonna start watching YouTube videos on how do you earn more money? How do you start a business? How do you start a side hustle? How can you increase your income? How can you change your career? How can you get a new certificate? And then you can start doing different things. And as you start doing different things, now you're gonna start seeing your income change as well. It's not gonna happen overnight. This is a process. Remember, a decade of sacrifice is more than just six months. We're talking about a decade of work, effort, 
time and learning to put in the work, to put in the effort. That way you can start getting the rewards of your effort after putting in the work, after putting in the time. Most people put in the work for six months and say, where's my reward? But you got to keep coming back, putting in the reps and understand now, what are the questions you got to ask? Because once you can control this, then it's all about how can you grow this? And as you grow this, remember, the key is to grow how much money you're putting into your investments. If you can grow how much money you're putting into your investments, you're going to be able to grow how much wealth you will be able to build. And if you can own more assets, then you also get to buy more freedom. In 10 years, you are going to surprise yourself. And you might be thinking, but Jaspreet, I don't want to wait 10 years before I can start using this cash flow. I want to have it today. Well, two things. Number one, building wealth is not an overnight game. And when you try to make it an overnight game, well, you end up losing a lot of money to people selling you a whole bunch of get-rich-quick services. So I want you to understand